So let me begin uh, with a, a look at the court structure in 2023, uh, just a reminder of how it works. Uh, you can see, starting at the bottom, the Patents Court judges, uh, Mr Justice Mead in charge of the Patents Court and Mr Justice Meller, uh, the two most technical patents judges, hearing most of the cases and being joined by a small army of deputies. That's been a feature of the system for some years now. Uh, Richard Hacon sitting in the IPEC, uh, judge in charge there. And then the Court of Appeal this year, we've shown the judges that have heard the most cases. Uh, so um, more than three each for each of the faces on the slide. Um, but there were other Court of Appeal judges here in cases too, probably over a dozen in all. So quite a busy year at the Court of Appeal, as, as we will see. The Supreme Court is included because we did have a Supreme Court case and the bench illustrated there are the judges that heard the case. Um, and uh, sadly for the profession, one of them retired in September. So goodbye, Lord Kitchen. Uh, many, many years of amazing service to the, uh, to the, to the patents judiciary and the bar. OK, so let's look at some numbers. Uh, what, what, what happened in terms of output of the court? Well, fairly busy, not the busiest year ever, but 72 decisions in total. Um, we always say, just a reminder, that's everything. That's costs decisions, interim decisions, case management decisions, etc. cetera. Um, when we look at the merits uh, and the trials that took place, there were 16 first instance judgments. Um, now, that number is a little bit down on on previous years, got the, the numbers here. I think uh, in 2022, we had 20, uh, and the year before that, 18. So 16 is a little bit low, but some of them were bigger, as we will see, because one of the one of the features of the year is it was quite a telecoms heavy year, um, and FRAND uh, in particular uh, tended to dominate. And those cases are big, they take a long time, and therefore there are fewer of them. Uh, I mentioned that the Court of Appeal was busy with 18 appeals. That's Two of those were in the High Court being appeals from the Intellectual Property Office. Um, one was the Supreme Court case. Um, but that number is, is quite a bit higher than we're used to. Normally, uh, the last few years, it's been 12, uh, 11 in the year before that, only six in 2020. So a big year for the Court of Appeal. And um, these numbers are all decisions. The, the number at the, at the bottom, 45 cases issued, that is the cases that have started. So that's for next year. The, these are the, this is just to show that the courts actually are very busy right now. If you go down to court, there's a lot of patents cases going on. The decisions will filter through next year. Um, so the, the, the jurisdiction is doing well. Um, and we can see that illustrated on this slide that counts the cases from the, uh, the IPEC, the High Court, and the Courts of Appeal. You can see 2023 is the second highest bar ever, sort of a joint, joint, uh, joint silver medal with 2022. So um, reasons to be optimistic about uh, the level of work in the UK at the moment. In terms of the judges uh, delivering those decisions we've talked about, uh, you can see by far and away Mr Justice Mead at the bottom there being the busiest, uh, with almost the double, double the output uh, of anybody else, um, Mr Justice Meller uh, in second place. These are, again, uh, decisions. These are written judgments, so they're not cases heard. So it may be that uh, James Meller heard some cases and hasn't written the judgments yet, and that wouldn't be reflected on the slide. Um, but the other feature to point out probably are, is the presence of deputies. So you can see that quite a few deputies, like Michael Tappin, uh, Nicholas Caddick, hearing more than a couple of cases. Um, and the, interestingly, the five cases heard by uh, His Honour Judge Hakon were not in the IPEC, even though he is the IPEC judge. Uh, he was sitting as a as a High Court judge when he heard those cases, and the one IPEC case we had was dealt with by Nicholas Caddick, KC. Right, so let's have a look at outcomes. Um, a good year for patentees, I think we can say in, in the round. Um, the trend on validity has turned upwards, so we're a approaching 50% valid. Uh, which is about as good as we ever get in recent years in, in the UK. The trend line runs at about 40%, but I think it's about 48% of patents held, val held valid, uh, which is good news for patentees. Less so on the infringement side, uh, a bit of a dip uh, in the patents being found infringed. Although the trend line is higher, it run, tends to run about 60%, only about 40%. Uh, of, of cases found infringement. Now that is taking the outcomes separately, which 
is a little bit artificial. If we look at cases where they are heard together, what, what, you know, what actually happened where both validity and infringement were in suit together, these are the outcomes. There are fewer data points, but the most popular outcome is still pro patentee five uh, cases where the patent has been valid and infringed. Uh, although the second uh, most popular outcome is the worst outcome for the patentee being invalid and not infringed. So sort of illustrating there that some polarity uh, in, in the results. Looking in a bit more detail at the individual grounds of invalidity, which I always think is uh, the most interesting part, um, what we show on this slide is the number of pleaded counts versus the number of counts that actually succeeded. And um, you can see that the sort of slightly less common grounds of attack, such as unpatentable subject matter or lack of industrial application, didn't succeed at all. Probably not surprising, very hard to get home on those grounds. Um, but novelty, lack of novelty or anticipation, was surprisingly high. 43% success rate on lack of novelty is, I think, quite surprising. Um, and actually, when you, you look at previous years, um, you see that. I mean, it, there were no cases at all in 2022 when, when lack of novelty uh, succeeded. Um, obviousness is well down. On what we would expect only 20% success rate on obvious is, is pretty dire. Uh, normally, we'd see it see it at around 50-60%. There was a recent year where it was 70%, uh, so not, not very good on inventive step. But I suppose we must remember that all these figures are going to be a little bit on the low slide because a lot of patents were held valid. Um, insufficiency, reasonably high, very often because that's wrapped up with lack of plausibility, as, as at least some of the cases during the year um, uh, had. Uh, but that figure of 43% is, is higher than in previous years where I think in 2022 it's 36% and it, it didn't succeed at all in 2021. So a good year for insufficiency and an average year for added matter. The, the UK, we always say that the UK is a bit more generous than, for example, the EPO on added matter. It's less formalistic, um, but 30% is about right on, on added matter. So we will see some of these grounds uh, come out in the cases that uh, we're going to talk about now. I'm going to hand over to Nadine, who will take you through the first of them. And um, yes, I'll come back to you later on uh, this evening. Thank you. So the first case, uh, number 10 of our countdown, is the Insignia and Shell case. And this case um, related mainly to uh, an issue of construction. And the question here was, what does a display mean? So the uh, claim related to a method for allowing a user to access a registered device service using what was called graphical encoded information. So that could be a barcode or a QR code. And the claim required that that QR code or barcode is displayed on a display. And then post grant, the patent was amended to say that the display is a sign. And on infringement, Shell was using what you may have seen, which are these fill and go service, where there's a plaque next to the station pumps where you can scan to access the service before filling up the car. And the question was, because that is a static sign rather than an electronic sign, does that fall within the meaning of the claims? So what happened? It was Charlotte May Casey sitting as a deputy judge who heard the case. And she found it very difficult because there were different parts of the patent app specification which were in contrast with each other. On one hand, the evidence suggested that the natural reading of the word display was um, an electronic display. And also there were some advantages um, stated in the patent which would only work if there were an electronic display. However, there was only one part of the description which had uh, an explanation of what the display as a sign would be. And this part of the description was amended post-grant together with the claims themselves. And so after some anxious consideration and with some hesitation, she decided that the patent was um, limited to a display as a sign and did not encompass an electronic display. And the main reason for that was because that passage which described the display as a sign stated that it was, the graphical information, when it is a sign, would also include excluded embodiments which were, which were where the display was an electronic one. 
Um, and so that was held to be the deliberate intention of the patentee. So why is this case important? Well, it shows that construction doesn't need to support the stated advantages necessarily. And it also shows that the deliberate intention of the patentee is really the main c consideration. But that it also shows that it's quite important to consider how to do amendments because whilst these amendments allowed the patent to be uh, infringed because the sign was limited to something which was static, which is what the shell did, um, the patent was ultimately invalid. And that's because by limiting the claim to saying this is this thing is done um, like uh, sorry the electronic display is without outside of the scope of the claims that was something which the skilled person would not have realized reading the claims before they had been amended in that way and so it was invalid for added matter and impermissible extension of the scope of the claims um, and at number nine we have our first uh, life sciences case, uh, Astellas um, versus Teva and Sandoz. Um, this is part of a wider dispute between um, the parties. Uh, there would previously last year been a, a revocation action brought by Teva and Sandoz to revoke a use patent for the active ingredient Myra Begron. Um, that was dismissed and then last year also the appeal uh, was dismissed. Um, this action here saw an infringement suit brought by Astellas against Teva and Sanders uh, in relation to uh, a modified release form um, of uh, the Myra, of uh, in relation to Myra Begron. Um, the patent sought to overcome a problem uh, of availability of uh, the medicine due to a food effect. Um, as I said, the claim was brought as an infringement action by Astellas. Um, Teva uh, admitted infringement on its primary form of the product, but had sought a declaration of non-infringement in relation to a second form, uh, and Sanders had not admitted infringement. There were counterclaims for invalidity based on uh, lack of inventive step, insufficiency as to whether or not um, the product uh, with this reduced food effect would be uh, work across the full scope of the claim, uh, as well as added matter. Um, as I said, the problem the patent sought to overcome was this, this food effect in the more conventional uh, formulation. Um, and as part of that, one of the important things the court needed to look at was the skilled team. Um, and I think it was Estellas' case from the beginning uh, that a for skilled formulator would would understand that there might be a problem with accumulation of the active ingredient and therefore wouldn't couldn't go any further than that. Whereas the generics, the advanced a case, that they would go and talk to a skilled pharmacokineticist. Uh, and that became quite an important part um, uh, of the evidence uh, and the result. So the patent was held valid, but not infringed. And a key issue was construction. Um, so, and it all came down to the meaning of uh, the particular words in claim one, which were a pharmaceutical composition for modified release. Now, in the specification, uh, there was a definition of that in one of the paragraphs, and there were some further defined terms within subsequent paragraphs. And when the judge was considering whether or not the definitions in those paragraphs, which included the reduced food effect, um, should be brought into uh, the proper construction of the claim. He asked the rhetorical question of why did the terms get defined if they weren't to be brought into the claim? Uh, and so he decided that that definition was the correct one and that therefore brought into uh, the, the correct construction of claim one the technical effect of the reduced food effect. Um, and that was a more favorable uh, to the generics construction. Um, when he was doing uh, that evaluation, as it says on the slide, the judge was keen to not look at something which was uh, being over meticulous, but wanted to be careful in his assessment of construction. Um, once he'd got to his point uh, on the correct construction, that then carried through into the rest of the analysis. Um, he decided that the patent was not uh, lacking inventive step, um, but would have been if he'd have found uh, for Astellas' construction. Um, it also didn't lack sufficiency. The claim had a range. Um, and while he looked at 
all kinds of different points to do with the range, he actually came in the end to a decision that really he just had to look as to whether or not it would work generally across there rather than why the two points were, were picked and he found that the pattern was sufficient. This um, importing of the technical effect of the reduced uh, food effect into the claim had uh, knock-on consequences for infringement in that the judge said you need to show this reduced food in, uh, effect to, in, to claim infringement and be successful, and that hadn't happened. So Estellas had failed to meet their burden uh, on proving infringement. So why is this case important? Um, one of the cases we talked about last year was the Teva and Novartis case where um, his honour judge taken had not taken into account a technical effect which was in the description but not the claims uh, and found a that that pattern uh, lacked inventive step. He said you can take into account technical effects for sufficiency but not inventive step. So something different, a little different, um, is happening here. Um, also, the composition of the skilled team, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, there was a difference between um, Estellas and Teva and Sandoz as to who was in that team, and the court was keen to emphasise that we needed to try and make the skilled team as close as the real team as possible, and that included the skilled pharmacokineticist, and that's why that was important. Um, also, to, just to point out about the burden on infringement, if there is bringing into account this functional language, what does that mean in terms of uh, trying to prove infringement down the line? I think here, um, Estellas made an application for specific disclosure at 4.30 on the last day of the trial to try and get some more evidence to meet their burden, um, but were not successful. Right, so next up is the Optus and Apple case, and here we're talking about one of the technical trials, um, and which went to appeal. And so it's in the context of telecoms, and specifically LTE. And the question um, related to search space allocation in LTE. So that's the specific part of the resource that the mobile phone needs to look at to determine where its control information is. And the patent came up with a way of determining this search space, and that was using a formula um, which included what was called a linear congruential and uh, generator, an LCG, which is a type of random generator, number generator. And um, the prior arts which was cited had a very similar formula to that in the patent, but instead of using an LCG specifically, it used a hashing function. And it was determined that the skilled person would know that the hashing function in the prior art was not a good choice for a random number generator. So the question is, was it obvious to then go and choose an LCG instead of that hashing function? And one of the key parts of the case was that the LCGs themselves were not common general knowledge. And the way that Apple went to show in validity was that they uh, relied on this standard reference work, which was called NRC3. And they said the skilled person would rely on that reference work, and then that in turn referred to another document called Knuth, which said that an LCG is a good choice for a random number generator. But NRC3 itself stated that you should never use a generator primarily based on an LCG. And it also explained that um, there was this misconception that LCGs were good, and they, they've been used in the field for a long time, but they are actually not a great choice. Although it did suggest that you could, in some circumstances, use them, but it was very limited. And the general thrust of NRC3 was don't use N LCGs. And so the first instance decision was mainly based on expert evidence, which stated that the skilled person reading this NRC3 document would realise, even if the LCGs were not CGK in and of themselves, that they were well known and they could be used. And although they weren't suitable for demanding applications, they could be used in other applications where you needed a random number generator. And on that basis, uh, Mr Justice Mead considered that the claim was obvious. So then we got to the appeal, and we had two patent specialists on the appeal panel, Lord Justice Arnold and Lord Justice Burse, and they came to different conclusions on whether the appeal should be allowed. Lord Justice Arnold considered that NRC3 taught away from the invention. Now, given that the skilled person has not come across an LCG before, and the first thing they read is L NRC3, which says never use an LCG, 
primarily, he considered that was teaching away and this, therefore it was not obvious to adopt that approach. The obvious thing to do was to use another um, random number generator which was described in NRC3. He also thought that the expert evidence which Mead had relied upon in coming to his conclusion was tainted with hindsight, given that the document NRC3 itself didn't say anything about only applying the, the warnings only applying for demanding situations, but rather he considered they applied more generally. And unless the skilled person um, had, well, the, the expert had come, adopted hindsight, they wouldn't have realised that an, uh, an LCG would be suitable for their application. Now, Burse, on the other hand, considered that Mead was entitled to reach the conclusion that he did, and that the expert view was not necessarily tainted with hindsight. And he used quite a fun analogy with spaghetti carbonara to, just, to explain this. So he said, imagine that you've got a celebrity cookbook which has a recipe for carbonara, and it says, only use spaghetti, eggs, bacon, and parmesan. And then uh, the, the cookbook goes on to explain that in the 1970s, cream cheese was often used, but you should never use that. Now, the skilled person who reads that recipe and hasn't heard of the cream cheese method might think, oh, OK, so the, so the author of this thing doesn't want me to use cream cheese, but it is an available option. And therefore, they, might, they would realise that cream cheese could be used on maybe an everyday weekday, week meal, week, weeknight meal, um, even though it wouldn't be suitable for a high-end restaurant, which is the context of the book. So Burse's idea was well, maybe it, the skilled person did know that it wasn't that the LCGs were not common general knowledge, but in the context of what was said about them, could realise that, oh, they, they were well known and could be used in my situation. But in the end, um, the other panellist, uh, Lord Justice Nuji, considered that Arnold was right and the document taught away, and so the appeal was allowed. So this is an important case. One, because it's very rare that obvious decisions are overturned. And two, because we've got two of the patent specialists disagreeing with each other on the approach. But it does show that it's quite difficult to rely on a document which warns against the teaching, although maybe there's some room for manoeuvre in light of Lord Justice Burse's comments. And it also explains that the meaning of a document is a question for the judge, um, which they all the judges agreed with, um, but stating that the expert evidence is there to help with the um, technical interpretation rather than actually determining what the true meaning should be. So in at number seven, we have another um, appeal court judgment, uh, this time in Vernicare and moulded fibre products. Uh, in 2022, um, and so covered uh, in last year's Prote, we discussed the first instance de decision uh, of uh, Mr. Nicholas Caddock uh, Casey sitting as a deputy high court judge um, within the IPEC and uh, he heard this case in relation to two Vernicare uh, patents um, relating to moulded paper wash bowls. Um, the first of those, the GB793, was to the shape uh, of the wash bowl. That was held valid and not infringed at first instance uh, with the Formstein defence um, applying. But GB947, which related to the composition uh, in within the wash bowls, was held valid and infringed. Um, so MFP uh, appealed that decision uh, in relation to the 947 patent. And the key claims were claim one, uh, which is in relation to uh, a um, detergent resistant uh, wash bowl with a binding agent being a fluorocarbon, uh, and claim nine, which is to the amounts of that binding agent which were included in the claim. So what happened? Um, it was held that the judge at first instance had erred in defining the inventive concept of claim one. He had read into that uh, inventive concept a purposive element which wasn't required, that being the detergent resistance. Um, and when you look at it on the proper construction, um, that requirement is, is not there. The fluorocarbon doesn't need to be added uh, for the purpose of detergent resistance. And when looking at infringement, you wouldn't need to show that the fluorocarbon had been added for um, detergent resistance, so it's not required. When 
you then properly construe the claim, you see in light of the prior art and the CGK that the claim is invalid. Uh, claim 9 followed uh, the same suit and was found to lack inventive step. Um, there was uh, some analysis here of the expert evidence which hadn't been considered by the judge at first instance. So the court went a little bit further than um, they would have done because this evidence hadn't been reviewed but now needed to be reviewed when looking at the claim in light of the proper inventive concept. So why uh, is this case important? Um, it was a reminder really for everybody uh, that it's important to make sure that the judge is aware of all the important cases that you want to rely on. Um, MFP uh, relied in the appeal on Helen and Brabantia, a case about uh, bonus effects, um, meaning that if a product or process is obvious for one reason, um, it doesn't matter that an additional unexpected benefit wasn't obvious. So here the prior art had shown that the uh, molded paper bowls in general um, had been found when a fluorocarbon was added to be resistant to oil and water. So it didn't really matter that they hadn't been shown that they weren't resistant to uh, detergent. They were still going to be obvious. And uh, Sir Christopher Floyd, who gave the leading judgment at the Court of Appeal, yeah, said that it was unfortunate and perhaps a different outcome would have uh, happened at the first instance had the judge been made aware of this authority. I think when we discussed this case before and when it was reported from the first instance, the application of the Formstein defence was what took up most of everybody's uh, thinking. Um, that patent, as I mentioned, didn't go on appeal, and so the reasons from the first instance in relation to that are still valid. Right, so the next case is the Nokia and Oppo case, and this is in the context of the standard essential patents. And here, Nokia had won its first technical trial and so had a valid and infringed patent. And the question was, should OPPO be injuncted in the UK? Now, because this is in the SEP context, um, they have a, there's a special kind of regime for how you get relief. So because um, an SEP owner has given an undertaking that they will grant frown terms, generally you don't get automatic injunctions in these cases, but rather um, there'll be a question as to whether they, they should enter into the frown terms or be injuncted. Now, following the... Oppo, Optis and Apple case, um, the court had decided there that, that if upon a finding of a valid infringed patent, the patentee doesn't commit to take frown terms, sorry, the licensee doesn't commit to take frown terms, then they should be injuncted. Um, now here the facts are a bit different because Oppo had undertaken to take a license on frown terms, but not those set by the UK court, instead those set by another court, the Chongqing court in China. And it said, in light of that undertaking that it would take whatever terms would be frowned by that Chinese court, it was either already licensed under the Etsy IPR policy, or it was at least a beneficiary such that it shouldn't be injuncted. So what happened? It was Mr Justice Mead who heard this case, and he considered that OPPO was not already licensed. The reason for this was, if they f he followed that logical extension, any implementer could contact a patent, patentee and say, I want, I want a license and I undertake to take a license without having had any discussions whatsoever and there'd already be a license in place. And here there is too much to be worked out in the gap for there to already be a license in place. They don't have any terms, any anything towards a license, any mechanism for necessary working out what the license terms would be. So that wasn't determinable and therefore there wasn't a license. On the second point as to whether they're a beneficiary and therefore a winning licensee, he considered that OPPO was not. Despite wanting to take a frowned license and undertaking to take a frowned license, it wasn't taking the frowned license by the UK court. And the UK court was necessarily going to take set something which is fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. That's, that's what frowned is all about. But um, they, uh, But it was for the patentee to choose if there are a number if there's a range of frown terms where in the range it wanted to offer and so going only to the Chinese court also had the risk that the UK court may not provide effective relief for patent infringement given that there was already a finding of a UK patent which is bad and infringed so I think the court wasn't very pleased about the idea that it would be leaving relief to another court where potentially they may not set frown terms or they might do so in a really long time and also the fact that this had to this reasoning had to apply to other cases, not just these very specific facts. 
Um, the court also considered that Nokia was a willing licensor because it had committed to take UK Frand license terms, and as such, Oppo was injuncted. But it was given a fra Frand injunction, so that meant that um, it wasn't automatically injuncted, but only insofar as it refused to take U Frand license terms. And at any point in time, it could change its mind and say, I want to take UK license terms set by the, Fran set by the court, and then it would be allowed to re-enter the market in the UK. So this is really important because it shows that it's very difficult for implementers in the UK to avoid a Frand injunction unless they're willing to take the license terms set by the UK court. It's also interesting because we had some uh, unprompted reflections at the end of the judgment given by Mr Justice Mead. One, he was reflecting on whether the result was fair because Oppo was saying it's not fair because well, we're going to have to leave the UK market because we don't want to take undertake to take what, terms that we don't know. And he says... Well, the whole point of FRAND is that it's giving you access to, to the standards, and you do have access to the standards, it's just that you're not wanting to take the terms on which you're giving access to the standards. So, um, so it was fair enough. And the other interesting point was in relation to trial listing. And the current practice up until this point was to have a number of technical trials followed by the FRAND trial. And the court considered that Perhaps it would be better to have the Fran trial earlier because the crux of these disputes was generally the Fran terms. How much should one party pay the other for a license? And leaving that a year or two down the line after all these technical trials perhaps wasn't in the interest of justice. And basically urging parties to reconsider how, the, how trials are ordered in the future. So we'll have to see to what extent that really bites, but there have already been cases where frown trials have been listed first before or in parallel with technical trials. Then at number five, we have uh, a case between two of the tobacco giants, Philip Morris and BAT. Um, so in this case, Philip Morris had brought uh, an invalidity action in relation to one of BAT's patents for its heat not burn technology where the tobacco is heated up um, and vaporized into an aerosol for inhalation, so the products are smoke-free. Um, the claims related to methods for heating, but also to how the temperature was exclusively determined um, within, uh, within the heating elements. Um, there were the grounds for invalidity, as it says on the screen, were lack of novelty, inventive step, and added matter. Um, there was a counterclaim for infringement by BAT uh, under the doctrine of equivalence, it being um, acknowledged that there wouldn't be infringement under a normal construction. Um, and in addition to that, there was a claim to amend the claims uh, by BAT um, uh, during the proceedings. Um, and finally, just to have one other thing in, this, in these proceedings, uh, Philip Morris also sought an arrow declaration. Uh, to say that at the priority date, um, some certain features or certain products um, would have uh, uh, should be free to be um, would have been new, so they should be free, uh, would not have been new. Sorry, so they would be free uh, to use those um, from from that date. So, what happened? Um, there was no uh, infringement uh, here um, found. So while the court considered that there was a clear uh, affirmative answer to the first two questions uh, of Actavis, whether or not um, the Philip Morris's uh, product would uh, fall within something which would be substantially similar um, and, and operate in substantially the same way. It fell down on the third ground where there was a strict uh, meaning of the interpretation of the claims was required. Um, BAT's patent was for um, an apparatus um, which had the heating element in and then a consumable uh, which contained the tobacco and they came together. Um, and Philip Morris's product had the heater in the consumable part rather than uh, in the apparatus. Um, and while BAT's patent had uh, disclosures within the description to embodiments that were um, that way round, um, that was not included in the claim. And so it was said to be, if it's not, uh, it was disclosed but not claimed and therefore it's not included. Um, and uh, that kind of uh, feature, uh, disclosed but not claimed, uh, was important. So the patent was held uh, to be novel um, but lacked inventive step. 
perhaps an interesting point, which kind of is a knock on from the uh, infringement analysis was also that the uh, amendments for added matter were not permitted. Um, again, there were illustrations um, within the uh, uh, description that would support the amendment that wanted to be made, but they were in relation to the other embodiment where the heater was not within the apparatus. And so again, they were not allowed to be made um, for, the, for similar reasons. Um, the Arrow Declaration was also refused. Um, His Honour Judge Hapon, um, when he was looking at this, um, summarised the case law that is uh, to date on uh, Arrow Declarations and distilled that into 12 points. He then added two of his own, um, and they were in relation to whether or not the Arrow Declaration served a useful purpose. He considered it was also important to consider whether um, uh, the portfolio of patents would create real doubt over a significant period of time and whether the patent applicant's uh, behaviour was such as to prolong that doubt. They were two things he additionally thought were important. While he refused the uh, to give the declaration um, because he felt he didn't really know enough about the products um, to understand whether they would serve it, it, it would serve a useful purpose, um, he also didn't give any reasoning as to technically whether or not the products would have been uh, new or old at the um, priority date because he felt that that would in fact be giving uh, Philip Morris a bit of a um, arrow declaration by the back door. Uh, so I think that's one thing to think about going forward. Um, so I put those two additional points uh, on the screen here, they're quite small, but um, uh, that uh, Hakon had included. And I think that this uh, finding on an arrow from last year follows the kind of trend of it's quite difficult to obtain one, but not impossible. And we now have this uh, kind of summary of all the points uh, which he has, he has put together. Um, also, as we mentioned on the disclosed but not claimed, that's obviously a, a continuing feature, particularly in relation to the doctrine of equivalence. And finally, the added matter point, which I mentioned, we often say that the UK has a much less strict approach on that um, added matter than the EPO. Um, but this kind of generalisation from one embodiment to another was not permitted in this case. Right, so the next one is our first case on AI, and this was the emotional perception and control of patents case. So this case all related to an artificial neural network and whether that was a program for a computer as, as such. And so the invention related to this ability of an ANN, artificial neural network, to pick um, a media file, perhaps a piece of music, that was emotionally similar to the music that the listener was currently listening to and then recommend something which was, so it's trying to find something which was on a human level similar. And the way the patent explained that this would be done is there were two artificial neural networks. One which was being trained to um, take two pa a pair of files and then read some text which is being inputted by a human to say, this is a really sad file, this makes me feel really happy, and work out how similar they are on a kind of emotional level. And then there was another um, ANN which was looking at uh, the properties of that file, so those two files, and seeing, well, are they similar in speed, are they similar in tone, timbre, all kinds of other things which it could just listen to without needing a human to type in, this is a sad song. Um, and the idea was that the, that second one, listening to the properties, would then adjust how similar it considered that those two files were based on its, what, what, the compute, what the person had put in as to how similar they were um, emotionally. And in that way, it was training itself to, based on the properties of the file, work out how emotionally similar files were so that it could then recommend them. And so this way of using an artificial neural network, well, the way it does it is it has these weights and biases, which it automatically changed in order to get the right output so that after over time, when you feed it a file, it would all be able to automatically choose one which is similar. And at first instance, the hearing office, hearing officer said that this um, ANN was no more than a computer program, and therefore the claim was unpatentable. And this went on appeal, 
and it was Sir Anthony Mann, who is retired but still sits as a judge now, um, and he considered that the hearing officer got it wrong. And he considered that the while the training stage, so the bit where the a person is setting the parameters of what the ANN should do and feeding it files and telling it this these emotional bits, uh, that was a training pro that was a that was a computer program because the computer was carrying out s some instructions which were set by a, a person. But then when it goes on to train itself to work out therefore from the properties how it's going to how it's going to adjust its vectors, that was done by the weights and biases, which was not uh, suggested by a human, that was it doing it by itself. So he considered that overall the artificial neural network was not a computer program at all. And he also considered that you shouldn't really fo just focus in on one part of the claim, which was the training stage, but you need to look at it as a, as a whole to, to, to work out whether the whole thing is acting, uh, the whole thing is a computer program. And he said even if he's wrong about it, whether or not it's a computer program, it didn't have, um, or it did have, sorry, it did have a, a technical effect. And that's because it wasn't just selecting any old file for a user to listen to. Um, it was making a selection on a very technical basis, um, and therefore the appeal was allowed. So why is this important? Well, in light of this uh, decision, the UK IPO had to change its statutory guidance so that ANNs were not automatically refused as, um, as pat being patentable. Uh, there is a question about whether an ANN could be a mathematical method, and that was raised on the appeal, but too late for it to be considered um, on procedural basis. But there is now an appeal of this decision, which is due to be heard in May 2024. So we'll have to see what happens there. But as a first stage, it seems to be a very positive step for AI in the UK. So sticking uh, with the AI theme, uh, we couldn't have this top 10 uh, without mentioning Davos. Um, so I think everybody probably knows the background facts, so I'll try and cover them quite quickly. Um, uh, Dr. Tala uh, filed two patent applications at the UK IPO in 2018. He named Dabas uh, as the inventor on the applications and himself as the applicant. Uh, he was asked by the UK IPO to provide further details on this and to fill in the statement of inventorship and if he didn't submit that within 16 months or sufficiently provide the information within 16 months, the patent applications would be deemed to be withdrawn under Rule 10 of the patent rules. Um, Roll on to, well, I suppose Dr. Tyler gave his response that he is the owner um, and kind of doubled down uh, on submitting that Dabas was the inventor. Um, yeah, roll on to the end of 2019 when the UK IPO uh, deemed these applications to be withdrawn, holding that Dabas is not a person within Section 7 and 13 of the Patents Act and so could not be an inventor. As such, he had, Dabas had no rights to transfer to Dr. Tala and Dr. Tala did not own um, the invention as a virtue of owning Dabas. Um, we saw appeals of this uh, to the High Court in 2020, to the Court of Appeal in 2021. Um, both appear, uh, dismissed um, uh, the applications and uh, upheld the decision of the UK IPO, but the decision was divided at the Court of Appeal. Um, while um, all three of the justices, uh, Lord Justices, were agreed um, that uh, Dabas was not a person and couldn't be an inventor, uh, Lord Justice Burse considered that that wasn't the end of the story and really you had to take into account what Dr. Tala believed um, to be the case as to who he believed to be the inventor and who he believed to be the applicant and it wasn't the IPO's job to go behind that. So that nicely teed up uh, a, a application for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, which was granted and heard uh, in the early part of last year, with the decision being handed down shortly before the Christmas break uh, at the end of last year. Um, possibly not surprisingly, given the decisions of the lower courts, the Supreme Court uh, unanimously dismissed the appeal. Um, they said that it is quite clear that an inventor has to be a natural person and there is no scope within Section 7 or 13 or wider uh, context of the Patents Act for um, an inventor to be anything other than a person. Um, as such, um, Dr. Thaler was not uh, the applicant or the owner um, and uh, 
certain doctrines, the doctrine of accession, which he tried to rely on in terms of him being the owner uh, because of uh, the owner of the invention, because he is the owner of the machine and therefore the owner of the thing owns the fruits of that thing, was also dismissed um, as failing to uh, appreciate that Davos was not the inventor and also meaning that uh, uh, inventions and things would have to equal the same as real property. Um, so with that in, in mind, uh, the Comptroller was right to uh, withdraw the applications at the end of the 16-month period. Um, I think it's fair to say that the court was keen to say that this decision was made on the law as it is and not on a policy basis and not on any uh, decision um, as to what the law should be. Um, and that begs the question of what next and why is this important? Um, so I think there has been a question uh, as to what will happen because the UK IPO's consultation recommended no immediate changes. But I think there is a recognition that what, if anything happens, it needs to happen on a wider scale than just uh, one country to make sure uh, that things align internationally. Um, I think it's fair to say we're not out of step in the UK with what's happened elsewhere, as you can see from the screen. Um, the only place that we're aware of that has granted the patent is South Africa, and they don't carry out substantive examination before grant. Um, I think it's also fair to say that Lord Kitchen may have given an out, uh, at least for now, until the law changes um, that may allow a way forward for AI inventions, and that is that... Uh, Instead of saying that the machine is the inventor, um, he suggested that if Dr. Tala had said that he was the inventor, there may have been a different outcome to this case. So one to think about going forward. Right, so this is our number two case, which is the Interdigital and Lenovo case, which was very exciting for those in the tech world because it was the second ever frown determination in the UK. Um, and so the main question here was, what, was a frown, what are frown terms? So Interdigital had sued Lenovo for patent infringement and there had been a hold, holding of a valid infringed patent. And so it was how much should Lenovo pay for a license to that patent? And in particular, it was trying to Interdigital was trying to justify its offer as being fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. And its offer was based on its program rates. And it had a number of licenses with other implementers to its program, and it used those in support to try and argue that its rates were frowned. And the other point to consider was what the appropriate remedy was um, in light of in light of this. Um, and so it was a very long judgment. I won't cover it all, but I'll try and capture the key bits. Um, so in terms of frown terms, so they, the court was with the parties in terms of comparable licenses. So other licenses to the interdigital portfolio it considered were the best evidence of what frowned is and because that's what other people in the market were paying for that same portfolio. But it didn't like interdigital selection of the licenses which it preferred because it said that interdigital's 20 licenses to its headline rates were with very small players and here it would be more appropriate to look at the bigger industry players because they're more relevant to this type of scenario. The parties also try to do what's called a top-down cross-check which was done in the Unride Planet case um, and that was something which was particularly relied on by Interdigital but uh, Mr Justice Meller didn't find that helpful and really thought it's all about comparables. Then there's the next part of the dispute was about the unpacking methodology. So that's taking the comparable licenses um, to the interdigital portfolio and trying to work out from that what the per unit rate is. So that's looking at what sales did each of those licenses cover, were there any discounts, how were they apportioned. And interdigital put forward a lot of evidence about each of the licenses to, exp to try and work out, say, how they should be unpacked. Um, and that was all based on its own negotiations and its own internal knowledge. And the court didn't really like that and preferred an objective approach. So instead of, for example, relying on the interdigital um, estimates of the sales for each of the uh, licenses that it had entered into, it preferred the court wanted to use third party estimates, which were market market intelligence. 
Similarly, instead of relying on discounts, which Lenovo Interdigital said that it had given to various licensed counterparties, the court preferred not to take those into account. And then the next aspect is once you've got your AMPAC rate from each of the licenses, or in this case, there was one particular license which Mella thought was most important, which was an LG license, um, then you have to apply that to Lenovo sales to work out what lump sum are, is due. Um, and in doing so, one thing which Mellis did was not take into account limitation periods. So one of the arguments by Lenovo was that it should only be going back to sales six years from this date due to limitation periods in the UK. And he said, this is not a quick claim for damages. We're trying to determine brand license rates and all you should be paying for all of the past sales. So that's what the license covered. Um, and he also applied what's called an emerging market discount to take into account sales in different ge ge geographies. And the final really interesting point was that, it's funny, it's interesting because he ordered, awarded interest um, and uh, he did so in the post uh, and the consequentials decision. And that was actually quite significant. It was 50, I think around 50 million was what the, what the interest was. Um, so that was 4% compounded quarterly. Um, and that's something which hadn't been done in previous brand cases, but the previous friend case in the UK. The other interesting point for practitioners was in relation to conduct issues. So there was a lot of argument about during the negotiations whether one party had been willing or the other party unwilling. And the court really glossed over all of that and, re and said the real main, the main point is whether any offer had, was friend. And, and that was the crux of the conduct case, other than the point which is related to the knock and opio decision, which is at the point that there is a valid infringe finding, then at that point, Lenovo should have been subject to an injunction um, if it wasn't going to undertake to take Fran terms. So that's a whistle stop tour of that case. It was really important because it's the second ever decision. There has since then been a third decision in the UK, which was in Ap Apple and Optus. And um, in fact, it was slightly different outcomes in terms of some of the key principles, but here the main principle was using comparable licenses was key. Uh, in Marcus Smith and Apple Optus actually took a different approach, um, which was a kind of top-down cross-check based on the implementer's own licenses, uh, but that's for another day. Uh, <laughs> uh, it does beg the question whether there will be a change to any license negotiation approach, given that the court wasn't taking into account the evidence uh, that the, that Interdigital had put forward as to this is how these licenses actually entered into and took its own approach. So will that drive then different approaches with parties having an eye for future litigation? We'll see. Um, perhaps it marks the end of uh, issues in relation to conduct of, of the negotiations being a big part of the litigation in Fran cases, because that was also the case in the Apple and Optus case where the, the judge considered that that was of no relevance. And the final point is whether interest is here to stay for infran determinations because both this decision and the Apple and Optus decision both uh, awarded interest on past sales. Finally, in at number one uh, is um, the Sandoz uh, and BMS, Teva BMS uh, decision from the Court of Appeal. Um, so this case uh, related to uh, revocation actions brought by Sandoz and Teva against BMS's compound patent and SPC uh, for a Pixavan. Um, the main foundation uh, of the claim for invalidity was one of a lack of plausibility, um, which as we know isn't written anywhere in the statute, but has become uh, a commonly pleaded ground um, of invalidity in the UK. Um, BMS had counterclaimed for infringement, although that was uh, admitted at, at first instance if the patent was valid. So previously, um, we covered uh, last year that Mead J um, had held in the High Court that the patent was uh, invalid for lack of plausibility. Um, and that then uh, instigated a permission to appeal by BMS to the Court of Appeal, which was um, heard and decided last year. That appeal um, was upheld uh, with the plausibility finding um, maintained. Um, I think it, at the first instance, uh, BMS had sought to rely 
on particular structural features and what was commonly known um, about the uh, factor 10A binding proteins, of which apixaban is one. Um, and that hadn't succeeded by appeal. They'd focused more on um, one of the examples in the patent which related to apixaban and one particular paragraph uh, in relation to particular KI uh, figures. Um, but in the end, n n none of that uh, mattered. And one of the main grounds of appeal was that the case uh, we all know from the Supreme Court, Warner Lambert, um, uh, which set the standard with Lord Sumption for um, sufficiency and, and plausibility uh, on second medical use claims, BMS had said that that didn't apply to them because they weren't a second medical use claim. But Arnold uh, said that wasn't the case. There was nothing to uh, say that it shouldn't extend out to, to compound claims. And in fact, um, some of the case law that was referred to in Warner Lambert and also in the G2 of 21 uh, were not related to second medical use claims. And so he expanded out uh, that, um, that finding. Uh, he said uh, he was bound by Warner Lambert, although he took into account um, some of the submissions that were made. Uh, in relation to the outcome of G2 of 21, which I think, as everybody knows, was the referral to the enlarged board uh, about uh, reliance on post-published evidence. Um, he uh, was quite clear that the patent bargain was the same, really, no matter what your claim was, and that's why he extended out the finding um, or confirmed that the finding of Warner Lambert wasn't um, restricted to second medical use claims. Uh, why was this case important? As I mentioned, it was the first case uh, in the UK to consider the outcome of G2 of 21. Um, uh, Arnold confirming, as I said, that he was uh, still bound by the Warner-Lambert uh, uh, proceedings from the Supreme Court um, and the ab initio plausibility test uh, that was in there. He thought that the UK EPO's approach was more akin to this kind of approach as well. Um, and he didn't necessarily agree with the EPO's comments in G2 uh, of 21 that the kind of ab initio plausibility versus ab initio implausibility approaches could be reconciled. And he thought actually that the decision in Warner Lambert, which was divided kind of along the lines of those two approaches, showed that that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, the permission to appeal by BMS from this Court of Appeal uh, decision was refused by the Supreme Court. We had been expecting um, a hearing in the Fibrogen uh, case before the Supreme Court as well. That would have touched upon certain issues of sufficiency, um, not directly the same as those in here, but some issues of sufficiency. But that case settled, so that's not been heard. So the question is, what's next uh, for plausibility in the UK, um, are we an outlier um, to the rest of Europe? So this is just a short slide to show where the decisions have gone on Apixaban uh, across Europe since G2 of 21. We obviously now have other decisions coming out of uh, the EPO interpreting um, G2 of 21 and what influence those will have and uh, decisions of foreign courts will have on the UK uh, practice and plausibility as we go ahead, we will have to see.